is this? Hey, there's one on the floor. Ah. <laughs> The bio on the floor. This is the only time I let the featured reader talk back to me like that. <laughs> okay, so today's January 27th. We are seeing Melissa Stuttered read from her brand new collection just recently come out. It is an Amazon bestseller currently. Melissa Stuttered's debut poetry collection, I Ate the Cosmos for Breakfast, was released this past fall. She is also the author of the Tiferet Talk interviews, the best-selling novel Six Weeks to Yehida, and its companion journal My Yehida. Her awards include the Forward National Literature Award, the International Book Award, the Reader's Favorite Award, and two Pinnacle Book Achievement Awards. In addition to writing, Melissa serves as an interview interviewer for American Micro Reviews and Interviews, and a host for Tiferet Talk Radio. She has received her MFA from Sarah Lawrence College and is professor for the Lone Star College System and a teaching artist for the Rooster Moans Poetry Cooperative. Please welcome Melissa Stutter. I'm walking with you. I'm walking with you. Okay. Such a nice introduction. <laughs> Um, I forgot to bring a copy of my book, so I borrowed one from Jeremy. This is what it looks like in case anyone wants to see it. Um, believe it or not, that's actually not me on the cover. <laughs> I just some, you know, the painting looked like me and someone told me about it and I was like, wow, that fits with my book. So, um, let me get this back to you. It's got a really nice bookmark in it too. <laughs> and that's Jeremy's. I don't know so it's out. So, okay, I'm really happy to be here and um, meeting a lot of you for the first time. And I understand there's an open mic afterwards, so I'm looking forward to having people read, too. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with the title poem from the collection, which is, the, the poem is also called I Ate the Cosmos for Breakfast. And um, it's about a pancake. <laughs> um, I want to say something really quickly. If I start running over, I don't want to go too long. Like, you know, just Usually throw tomatoes or, or, you know, whatever. Just raise my hand. Yeah, just like, hey, get out of here. <laughs> okay, so um, I was reading a lot of Buddhist philosophy at the time, and um, this poem is after Thich Nhat Hanh, the Buddhist philosopher. It looked like a pancake, but it was creation flattened out. The fist of God on a head of wheat. Milk, the unborn child of an unsuspecting chicken all beaten to batter and drizzled into a pan. I brewed some tea and closed my eyes. While I ate the sun, the air, the rain, photosynthesis on a plate. I ate the time it took that chicken to bear and lay her egg, and the energy the cow takes to lactate a cup of milk. I thought of the farmers, the truck drivers, the grocers, the people who made the bag that stored the wheat and my labor over the stove seemed short, and my pancake tasted good, and I was thankful. <laughs> okay, the next one is called Om, and um, you'll discover in this poem that God is a woman. <laughs> In my book, anyway. <laughs> so every time Poetic there's a lies. reference, what's that? Poetic lies. Yes, yes, Kali. <laughs> so, um, so every time God is mentioned, it's a woman. Oh, so. um, she sent us flowers without a card. God did that trickster soul. It must have been a sound that started it all, and she's still out there somewhere laughing while we seek directions or direction, while we, the addressees, search for an addresser, while we sort and sift and categorize and collect and buy and classify and analyze, our refrigerators hum to us, and heaven knows the bugs make their merry at night. Once I even saw the color yellow, when I imagined Van Gogh strolling out his thick vibrancy onto the page, that yellow was anything but humdrum. Do y'all want me to pause for a minute and see if I'm getting irritated? Shut up over there! No, David, David went, David went. Oh, is someone else is going to go? Okay, you got the cloud. Oh, it's high school. Okay, so I'm, what was the last thing y'all heard? Why don't you just start, start over? Okay. She sent us flowers without a card. 
God did, that twixt her soul. It must have been a sound that started it all. And she's still out there somewhere laughing while we seek directions or direction. While we, the addressees, search for an address. While we sort and sift and categorize and collect, divide, classify, and analyze. Our refrigerators come across, and heaven knows the bugs make their merry at night. Once I even saw the color yellow when I imagined Van Gogh stroking his thick vibrancy onto the page. That yellow was anything but humdrum. I swear, I felt it on the roof of my mouth and at the back of my throat, a yogic ritual or some sort of tension stunt yeah. to even deep in my chest. Yes, I felt yeah, that. Yeah, no, in the clothes, oh, I'm yeah, sorry, and in the other room, the clothes and the washer Round and around a a spinning universe, and next to them, a parallel world, the driver, connected by the same outlet coming away. This life is anything but telephone. With all this motion and noise, hell, I can hardly even hear over the buzz of my phone, which I have cursed for interference which I have indignantly labeled that silver piece of shit, which I have threatened to replace, like it cares, and which was really gone all along. Washing clothes, I've since learned, is an act of prayer. <laughs> They start talking at the exact same place when I read it. That was so funny. Okay, um, I wrote this poem after I watched my daughter watch a documentary. And um, it was a documentary about these two men who were gay conversion therapists, which means that they took these kids to camps and they were supposed to like, um, you know, get the gay out of them. But what happened is that these two men ended up in a town that only had this one hotel and it only had one room left and there was only one bed. And so they ended up becoming lovers. And um, so they went from being gay conversion therapists to gay activists. So this poem is for them. <laughs> um, it's called For Two Conversion Therapists Who Fell in Love and Became Gay Activists. <laughs> Sometimes God holds up a mirror full of fate and you find yourself in a king bedroom in a one hotel town with no vacancy, flashing amber epiphanies across each other's eyes. Train yourself then to bear witness to divine love, the infinite grace, the ultimate knowing. You've heard it said God sleeps in the stone, dancing, dances in the king with a split stick, but who knew she also rustled among cheap white sheets? Don't put a black light on those things. What came before doesn't matter. Listen to grace in the coffee maker strip, in the crying infant next door and the annoying whir of the window unit blowing air. Listen when God knocks on the door in the morning and says, I brought you a paper, some orange juice, and two even colored plums. The truth is, God is sprawled naked across the sky. The truth is, God runs the bordello inside your heart. It's full of all life's misfits you tried to hide, the mullet and skinny legs, the letters you wrote to the man next door but never sent. Your secret affinity for reality TV. Make love to every luscious thing you find there. Your atoms have come to worship and rejoice at the temple of the familiar. Thank you. The next one is called We Are the Universe. And it's actually inspired by the painting on the cover of the book because I had it as my screensaver on my computer. And um, I just saw it for so long. It got sort of embedded into my subconscious mind and I was having dreams about it. And one night I just woke up and um, wrote this poem and then went back to sleep. And then and the next morning I found it and I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> that's about the painting. So um, it's inspired by the Eric Appenson painting, The Bravest Woman. We are the universe. Watching your mouth as you eat, I think that perhaps an apple is the universe, and your body is an orchard full of trees. I've seen the way your leaves cling to the ground and fall, and I noticed then that your voice sounded soft, like feathered, drifting things coming finally to rest. Note, 
I was the core in your deep flesh. You were hungry birds and foxes walking through the miles of me. You climbed, dug your nails in my bark, yanked something loose. Don't tell me what it is. Just keep it close. Because I planted these rows and rows of myself for you. So I could lick the juice from your lips. So I could remember how round and hot the promise of seed. If I could find that orchard right now, I'd run all through the rows of you. I'd stand in the center and twirl until dizzy I fell. I'd climb high and shake until the only thing left in you was longing. And you'd write a poem for me. You'd say, your mouth is the universe. <coughs> your desire is an orchard full of trees. This is called When You Do That. When you do that, it, and the title is the, also the first line of the poem. <laughs> Pretty neat, huh? <laughs> I perform that trick. <laughs> when you do that, it feels like millions of tiny harps are playing inside my body, and all the extinct animals that ever were are again running into you inside me. Their hooves and claws burning on the unexpected asphalt, their tongues alive with the ministry of life. This one is called Starry Night with Socks, and um, it is what well, you probably know that Neruda has a famous poem called Ode to My Socks, and uh, Vincent Van Gogh has a famous poem called Starry Night. <laughs> So I was thinking about genius, and specifically artistic genius, and I just sort of got off on this like thought trail about how different the genius of Van Gogh is from the genius of Neruda, but yet it's also similar in other ways, so I ended up writing this poem. Neruda eats gates and barbed wire, <coughs> absorbs the nails and exhales a borderless world, language that skips and spins across the ground of flight, syntax that never learned what it couldn't do, so does. Van Gogh saw the aura of night, of death, pipe, chair, saw thick swirls of angst and relief in the sky, everything pulsing and alive, vibrant with beam, the skirt swish of a spiral galaxy, the cypress fingers reach, space-time splayed with light and steeple, with neurons firing into the curve of line. A synaptic dance between canvas and paint, landscape and bowed, from the poet's mouth by the painter's hand. Simple strokes lead to love. And know now what Neruda saw. A sock can be the microcosm of all things good, knitted by Mara Mori with glowing strands of twilight and thread. Holy as a sacred text, place on that great altar, the foot. Because things are not things alone. They are also that which made them. A sock is a little woolly gum. It is a woman stopping by with a gift. It is the warmth of two hands rubbed together, a fire cradling your heels and soles. The next poem is called Everything is So Delicious. <laughs> I like to eat. <laughs> Sometimes I feel so hungry, so thirsty, I don't want to die. This desire to butter and eat the stars, this desire to pack the sunset in my bag and run home with her, with the terrarium for the moon. You see, a pirouette once courted a flying leaf. The <coughs> whim of day married the indispensability of night. <coughs> my parents were born, half human, half dream, unafraid of madness, desperation, delight. Weavers of magic, gifted with the ability to bend and reshape time. That's why, if I climb a tree, I can find the top of myself. If I dig up the garden, galaxies start seeding there. Look at this bloom of world, this unfurling universe drifting to rest on my tongue. Even the mud is primed for making pies, and the chopped up meaty bits of scalp, and the salted ocean, and the light in me 
the life in me so piquant and sweet. I've claimed my banquet from the ether, and I'm never letting go. <laughs> Okay, this is called Integrating the Shadow, and <laughs> yes, it is Jungian. <laughs> I was thinking about my shadow self, because um, you know, we have that duality as humans, and sometimes it can be a little troubling, so I worked it out on the page like we're supposed to do as right. <laughs> Integrating the Shadow. I was a bird in the hand of God. I was two in the bush. The yin to my own yang, yang to yin. Drinking gin on the porch at midnight, or otherwise drinking tea. You see how it is, Bach on Tuesdays, Thursdays, acid rock, tie-dye t-shirts and jeans. Mornings, I fed the needy and blessed their souls with sticky kisses. I sang to them and lotioned their feet with lilac cream and peppermint oil humbled by their poverty, inspired by the way they got out of bed without cigarettes or coffee. Afternoons, I cursed their lazy asses and stepped over them in the streets on my way to the pub, seeking a little warmth or a quiet corner in which to ponder the implication of lips on grass, to dance unmolested with my own shadow, which was my worst enemy, and conspicuously my only friend. I was a bird in the hand of God, I was two in the bush. I was a pair of white pants and a drive-by puddle splash. A drunk with beard on the front of my shirt. I was a ketchup on my own sleeve. A rash on an otherwise clear face. A tainted, defiled disaster stained by life, soiled and damn near faced by that often unrecognizable prankster. My troublemaker. My doppelganger. That saucy vamp, Grace. <laughs> Okay, so now we're to redemption because this one's about my daughter. <laughs> um, and it's called Daughter. Uh, maybe y'all can help me with titles afterwards. <laughs> Poor Rosalind, Daughter. Because I was a kid and you were the bird that flew through my hollows. When they bathed the pain away, the light <coughs> on your face looked like peace after a long time. Kevin 222, please. Kevin 222. I should work that into the power. <laughs> it would really do something good. I knew then what it meant to conjure fire from two sticks, to be an ocean giving life to a wave, to invent the wheel and its axle, unwind, torque, create a perfect language from gurgles and sighs. Your body was a new and sacred space. I was a universe cooling after a great expanse. And because bright cells clung together to be you, I could believe I built the ark that saved humanity. And animals walking two by two, that I'm the one who sat beneath the Bodhi tree and begot the sacred fig of enlightenment. I tell you, Athena sprung from my own split head. Because emergence is a teaching. Because your hands and feet were softer than sand. Because before there were canyons, or valleys, or lakes, or winds, you curled your hand around my finger, and with your touch, delivered the all. I'm an English professor counting as not my forte. <laughs> I have four-ish left. <laughs> I'll read four and a half. Subterranean. I'm not talking about the underside of a kitten's belly or the layers of dress on a modest woman's corpse. I don't mean that beneath the skin there's a world of vein, meat, and bone. No, I'm talking about mantle and core the viscous, shifting substrata beneath the camel's hoof, beneath the sand, beneath the crust beneath the sand. I think there are birds in there, flying around inside the earth's body, birds flying over oceans, streams, and lakes, children laughing beside rivers, mothers calling them home to supper by beating wooden spoons on the sides of aluminum pots. It doesn't matter that we can't see them, or even that my theory has been disproven. 
I go where the laughter is. Pure and simple. And I say this ball of clay is really an onion. A snake coiled around a bouncing ball. A swirl of petals exploding from the body. It's simple, really. Love is the path on which I his path. Everything he owns, everywhere he goes, the only article that can't be left behind. And we've all got our thumbs out, pointed towards that other realm, the one beneath the skin, beneath the bone and marrow and vein and strings of blood, where gods await us like lovers, like dense smoke, like cracked and forgotten mirrors, reflecting the singular route of home. Mm. This is called You Were a Bird, You Are the Sea, and it's on the Icarus myth. Um, you know, Icarus, his father built him wax wings, and do we all know it? <laughs> okay. I don't get to teach today. <laughs> it's also inspired by painting by John Sokol called Icarus Practicing. Stretch them wide as God's first breath. From tip to tip, there is no time. Just the rumbling of a tune in your makeshift feet and bright sky galloping through the hollow of bone. Bucket of air, spine built from light, void full of flutters and drafts. You speak mountain stream, laurel leaf, rolling cloud, the dialect of flight. The world drifts like a madness inside you. Earth, trees, and birds, feathers, wings, and night. The start and end of time, rowing through blood's currents, sailing inside the free freedom of mind, now split open by a whirlwind of cone, pushed through air, pushed like air through skies vast long. When I go, let me go like you, Icarus, past my own limits before I fall. Let me be a flesh tone streak in the sky, a flash in the blue, a sunburst of wonder. Rejoining the ripples of sea. Yeah. It looks like this too. It's just a straight drop into the sea. <laughs> it's very long and skinny. And this is my last poem. It's called A Prayer. Someday I'll meet you again, and we'll sleep like the eyes of hurricanes, lidless in our track to taste each other's tongues, as they threw dirt over my face and into the quivers of my throat. I've been meaning to say a little something each night, to light a candle in the door frame, set fire to the empty church. For you, I drive the people back into each other's arms again, where they could see, finally, your softness. I meant to say I knew you were unhoused, the original nomad. There were none living there among the pews, what was left was pressed among the pages of psalmody. And this is no new thing. Another costume moth. My golden hair, my blue-green eyes, shed beneath the dirt. I meant to say, how are you? And also, this is not about me. Because there are tigers scratching at the swirling wind, and there are monsters banging on the shutter doors. Because I've had no time to think, or eat properly, or rest. It was all just a blind sneeze in the wind. Let me know everything about you. I'll go back. Do it right this time. I'll be a dragonfly, a pebble, an earthworm, a flea. Thank you. Oh. <laughs>